Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone for attending our talk. Um, so today, I'm, uh, this is Aristo and I'm Eli. We both come from the Stanford Security Lab. And uh, today, I'm going to speak about uh, embedded management interface security. So uh, what our talk is about. Uh, first, our talk is about a massively deployed device uh, that you all use on everyday basic. For instance, uh, some of you are currently using an access point uh, to browse the internet. And you have switches in your local network, and you have uh, maybe at home some embedded devices like your NAS or stuff like that. More precisely, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to speak about the uh, management interface that you use to configure this kind of device. And hopefully, we'll speak about uh, which attack we found on this kind of embedded device interface and uh, how you exploit them. And of course, give it a little bit discussion about uh, how you can uh, secure them and do a better job. So which kind of device are we speaking here? Uh, first, very well-known one, printers, switches, routers, uh, IP camera that is widely deployed in enterprise, uh, NAS, of course, as I said, IP phone, and maybe more surprisingly for you, even photo frame and something you don't see, but you probably have a light out management, uh, which is uh, available in server and in some high-end laptop. Um, all these devices have one thing in common. Uh, now these days, they all use a uh, web interface to be configured. Why? Uh, because it's easier for user, obviously, as the user has already uh, attuned to use their browser to do configuration, so it's pretty intuitive for them. And for a vendor, it's pretty cheap because they don't have to ship a configuration software. So everyone kind of like it, so it became the ubiquitous technology. So, but before getting into the detail of what we found and which attack we found, uh, let me give you some numbers so you can better have a better sense of how big the problem is and uh, a little bit more sense of how devices uh, do uh, it's part of our life. So if you take the internet, uh, according to Netcraft, there is 240 million uh, domain register. And among this domain, 72, 72 million are active. Uh, and we both all know here that web security uh, is becoming one of the most, if not the most prominent issue nowadays. And it's not surprising that a lot of security research is attracted to this way, way well-known website. And, known application like PHPBB, and you, are, you have a lot of research. Uh, now, one assumption is that the uh, device I'm speaking of are part of the long tail, very, very far, and no one look at them because basically it's not important. Uh, well, now if we take the, the number, it's clearly not true. Uh, for instance, uh, they are everywhere. Embedded applications are everywhere. You have more than 100 million access points in the world. Uh, this is the coverage from uh, San Francisco. You see they are all over the place. And you have this kind of embedded interface everywhere in your switches, printer, IN technology. Uh, more surprising, and thanks to Park Associate, we have this number, uh, we estimate by 2013 there will be more embedded device in our homes than there is uh, internet web server. So you have it not only in your company, but at home, and sooner, it would, be, it would be like a mass factor, rather bigger than what we see over the internet. So our claim is, uh, well, instead of putting the embedded device security on the part of the far, far, far on the long tail, it might be better to put them somewhere in the middle, not maybe as big as Facebook, but somewhere there and get more attention to it. So right now, the, the, it's kind of a recipe for a disaster that we are facing. A uh, vendor build their own web application for managing the device, and there are hardware manufacturers, so they're not really web security aware. So they build something with you sometimes a, a very well-known web server, like like HTTPD, or something very exotic. One of the devices, I won't tell the name, use a web server which look like to be one come from a botnet. And some of them use, all of them use their custom application to manage this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, manage this, this device. So, and they try to put new feature all the time. Uh, if you look at, for instance, the photo from market, they try to put more feature, like you can pull out a photo from internet, you can send photos through email and stuff like that. And it's a very, very fast pace. So if you throw, throw out all these feature at a very fast pace, it's likely that the security check on them are very, very low. So at first, when we try to audit this kind of device, 
uh, we thought that some device get it right. So for instance, this is a Kodak photo frame. Uh, this page is completely secure. Uh, we try everything on it, CSRF, XSS. Everything is completely escaped. It's a good job. Now, the problem is uh, there is a new page. So this new page allows you to download interface and photo from interface. And sadly enough, well, you can inject XSS on this one. So it's almost right. Uh, as a result, the big result is over all the device we did audit over the last three months, we found vulnerability in each of them. We didn't find a single device which has not, uh, no vulnerability. We would have been happy to put here, yeah, we have one guy who is not. Well, we don't. So the outline of the talk would be this. Uh, first, we would describe you uh, how you do audit this kind of huge broadcast of device. And then we'll show you the best attack we found, the most interesting one, and discuss more of them in depth. And then we try to explain you what we think we can do to prevent this to become an emerging big issue. Because once this talk will be released, we think more many people will start looking at this device, and you will have a rise of vulnerability. So, methodology. Uh, what we do, what we did, is we did it in three phases. So, the first thing we tried to do to do was uh, look at brand. Uh, we wanted to know whether it's a problem for a specific brand, like small vendor, or a specific vendor, or it's uh, all over the place. So we tried to get as many brands as we can. Then we tried uh, to see how much device type we can get. Uh, like we found web interface in a photo frame, and it's likely that there is other kind of device we did under overlooked. And if you have any idea of device we missed, we would be happy to test them as well. And finally, we try to find new kind of vulnerability. Uh, I will go into more detail on that in a few, um, in a few slides. So overall result, we tested, as I said, eight categories of device. I showed them in the few previous slides. Over 16 brands, and we did test 23 devices. Uh, so basically, we have a huge number of them. And uh, even if the third did not answer, you, answer us yet, we report more than 50, 000, uh, 50 vulnerability to the search. So we have like this huge amount of vulnerability all across this place. And some of them are very serious, some of them are less serious. And some vendor did a good job like Intel to help us to fix them. And uh, we want to say that it's hard to patch them because it's an uh, embedded device and most of people actually don't update if they're embedded device. So what kind of attack did we look at? Uh, first, we did look at cross script for attack, of course, XSS and CSRF. And we have one other thing which is kind of new, uh, not, we, we, that we term cross-channel scripting. I will give you a more de example detail, but the idea is instead of trying to inject through the HTTP, you try to go to another channel like FTP, SMTP, SMB, and stuff like that. And it's pretty efficient on some kind of devices like NAS. Uh, we also look at for file security and, of course, user authentication like bad password, non-password, no HTTPS, and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm not sure everyone is familiar here with, with XSS, so let me just give you an example on one of our devices we tested. So this is a D-Link uh, DNS treatment D-Link. So it's used to share data and, of course, have a web interface. So what happened is uh, you try, instead of putting the name of a file or the name of a device, you put uh, a script in the form. It is stored, and, of course, it is reflected uh, to, the, to, the, to the browser of the administrator, for instance, and of course the browser burns. That's the basic one that everyone knows by now. And of course, if you do it real, in the real life, then you end up uh, putting our nice logo into the Dellink embedded device. So that's the first one. Uh, the other one is a sleeping giant. I think it has been presented here for the first time uh, a few months, a few years ago, uh, on a switch this time. So Netgear Net switch, but every switch we did audit has this kind of problem. So Netgear is not the one to blame. Uh, so same thing, uh, the administrator um, administers the, the, the switch, like changing SNMP configuration, leaves the tab open for any reason because we all have like this huge number of tabs on our browser open, and then he browses the internet, go to any website, and using an ad, uh, the attacker is able to make a request, ask the browser to make a request, the browser make a request to the switch, the switch accepts the request, and the switch actually reboots or is disabled. Now the problem with that is CSRF might allow you to store your uh, Gmail account, if you remember the, one of the first talk. Now the question is what happens if your, your switch goes down? 
Well, if your switch goes down because it's reboot, then all the server connected to them burn as well. So you end up by a simple CSRF to completely disable your entire local network. So that's a huge problem. Uh, back to X XCS. So XCS on this lazy Ethernet NAS device. Uh, so XCS, the idea is instead of going through uh, through a web in, uh, injection, we're going through FTP this time. So you create a fake file uh, with a script name on it. And by, by default, it's not a problem because FTP does not care about HTML tags. So there is the, the FTP by itself is completely secure. There is no buffer overflow, no nothing in that. And it stores the file because it has no reason to not doing it. The problem is now the uh, administrator goes to the device, try to administer it, and this time the file name is reflected to the browser. And the browser do care about HTML tag, and once again, the browser dies, once again. So as a result, uh, you are able to bypass authentication. So if you have two share, one is public, one is not, then you can inject the file in the public share with a specific crafted name, and you are able to leak out protected files. So basically, using uh, this kind of XTS, you're able to leak out a uh, sensitive file or not. That's, that's part of the problem. So more generally, um, an XCS is the idea that you use any alternative channel you can find. And uh, we have seen previous work bef before our work who'd use, for instance, DNS injection, uh, DHCP name injection, uh, SM SMTP injection, SNMP injection. And then you, reflect, you store them to the device somehow, and then it's reflected to the browser. Why is it's a little bit different from XSS? Because your web application by itself and any test you put on the web application will completely pass. Your web application by itself is secure. Your SNMP server is secure. Your FTP server is secure. The interaction between the two is not, and it's very hard to, uh, to do this kind of test automatically, or it's very hard to spot some of the complex interactions that you can have. Um, so one thing I really, really want to emphasize is uh, this device by themselves might not be important. But the switch is. But some NAS devices are not really important, or does not appear very important, because you say, well, I must focus on my internet. I'm a web server. I might focus on my FTP server. Now, the problem is you can use them as a step zone. So let me uh, just go through this. Maybe all of you guys know that. But uh, you administer the device once again, creating a new share, for instance. And then you browse the internet. And once again, the attacker just put an ad with a script. I mean, it, doesn't, it costs nothing. You can have 1,000 print for $1. So this kind of scenario is completely likely. I put it on the Financial Time or a very well-known website. That's not a problem. Then, of course, the device gets infected because it's not protected against CSRF. So you can inject any payload you want on it. And as a result, every time uh, someone access a device, to administer it, to see a file, to change configuration, then the malicious payload is sent to the, to the browser, and the browser do attack the local network. So the problem is, if we don't fix uh, this device, it, became, it becomes the weakest link of our uh, entire chain of security, and that's where hacker will go through. I mean, why are we going to do uh, Apache, find a vulnerability in Apache, which has been audited one at a time, when you can go to this device and find a vulnerability in five minutes. That's why it's so big. So, well, don't, I hope any vendor here, don't take it personally, please. Uh, we found the vulnerability in a lot of brands. Uh, if some of people here who didn't receive updates from the search want to come after and we will disclose everything we found for this kind of brand, uh, we found vulnerability, in, as you see, in most of the prominent company. Dell, Dell Link, Intel, as I said, Netgear, and most unknown company like Buffalo or East Starling that we'll see. Uh, so it's all over the place. Uh, if you want a more visual picture, this is uh, my desk after the test. So I'm kind of happy to have my desk clean now. Uh, so if you look at what kind of vulnerability we found, uh, not surprisingly, we found XSS all over the place. We found CSAF all over the place as well. Uh, we found authentication problem all over the place. Uh, and one question we tried to answer, and our coverage is far from being complete, is, is this a brand problem? Is this a kind of device problem? Or is this over over the place? So as I said, we tried to, fi to find very well-known brands like Linksys and very esoteric brands like Starling, who do only photo frame, or Buffalo, who specialize in NAS. 
and as a result, as you can see, it's all over the place. Uh, it's not a specific brand, it's a specific device. It's all this web management interface that has completely overlooked. Uh, another way to see that is to try to have an attack surface measurement. So what we try to, to see is, let me show you some example of what we, we found. So we found confidentiality problems. So confidentiality problem would be, uh, does my device really protect my private file from being accessed? Uh, we found five of these 23 devices who has confidentiality problem. For integrity, it's even worse. Is it possible to alter the configuration? Is it possible to alter the file? For 22 of them, it's possible. Uh, for availability, uh, can I reboot the switch? Can I prevent the administrator to access the switch? Uh, 18 of them are vulnerable. Uh, for access control, uh, well, all of them are vulnerable, and there's something which is, should be fixed rather easily, which is, do not have a default password. Ask when you log to the, to the device to change the password. Uh, allow people to access the files to HTTPS and stuff like that. So all of them are bro broken one way or another, and it should really be fixed. And finally, one, one thing which is very concerning for us and should be concerning for you as well, I guess, is attribution. So the problem is all these devices, or most of them, lack of logs. So basically, even someone, if, you want, if you find out that something goes wrong, you go to the device and you look at the log. There is no log, so you are not able to pinpoint out who did what. So knowing where the attack comes from or who is the bad guy is completely almost impossible with this kind of devices. So even for audit, uh, it's completely bad. So I will end up the speech to Aristo, which go into more detail of some interesting attack we had. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so it, it's actually interesting that uh, kind of the final words were about uh, not everybody is putting uh, you know enough information in logs because uh, the first attack we'll we'll uh, talk about quickly as a warm up is uh, actually related to logins uh, more specifically in uh, lights out management systems which is where we started um, our work um, last fall. Um, and so I will uh, talk a little bit about some basics for uh, lights out management systems, uh, and then I'll uh, uh, talk about uh, the log uh, cross-site scripting a little, and then uh, go into the attack. So lights out management systems, uh, how many people uh, here are familiar with uh, the concept and, and use these? Okay, so a certain amount. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a little, a few details. Uh, the, the, the whole idea behind this is that uh, your IT department needs to be able to, uh, you know, manage, recover, uh, and track inventory even when machines are down. And so traditionally the way to do that is, uh, you know, people go around, they look under desks, they power machines on, uh, take serial numbers and all that. So. Uh, these uh, lights out management modules were, uh, people came up with them uh, in order to make that task easier. So traditionally, uh, the, 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 they were uh, seen in a flavor which is a PCI uh, form factor. It's a, it's a PCI card which uh, you add to your server and it has a dedicated connection uh, to the motherboard where it can look at sensor information, uh, do some maybe APMI stuff. Um, and what we're seeing recently is also uh, this functionality is getting embedded in chipsets. So Intel has vPro and AMT. Uh, AMD has a similar uh, type of technology um, in the works. And, and so they are really becoming part of every machine that you get. So if you have a Core 2 uh, uh, system, maybe a laptop from, a, from Lenovo or other vendors, uh, it has that technology and it can be um, turned on and used. So uh, typically the way uh, uh, these modules um, are set up is uh, they either have a separate NIC or if they're part of the chipset, they share the NIC uh, the, that's on the motherboard, uh, the, the, the system uh, NIC, and they have their own administrator. Um, usually it's, uh, it's, it's somebody who, who is allowed to log in to manage uh, the system as a whole, not necessarily the, the operating system administrator although a lot of these modules have uh, functionality which uh, enable authenticating with Active Directory. So in uh, enterprise settings, uh, you can actually uh, deploy them and, and manage them more easily. Now, uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, a lot of uh, these systems, the default settings are not, not very secure. Uh, for example, 
very often what you see is that you can actually use uh, plain text HTTP to, to manage the device. You're not required to use SSL. Even if you're required to use it, you might um, actually uh, start out using a, a hard-coded certificate. So even though there are warnings to replace the certificate after, you know, immediately, uh, you know, you can imagine that not everybody uh, by far is, uh, is following the policies, right? You have to have a CA, you have to sign certificates, uh, do a bunch of steps. So uh, that's not necessarily uh, the standard practice. Um, the, other, the other point to highlight is all that traffic that uh, comes to the, uh, to the uh, Lights Out Management module and, and goes out back to the network is not uh, visible to the operating system. Now, you could trace it if, uh, if your device is on the hub. You can, you can uh, actually see the traffic, but normally the, the OS doesn't uh, see it uh, as it uh, captures uh, packets off of uh, the local device. And in addition to that, they, th these modules are, are treated as, as very trusted, right? They have this function which is uh, very um, security sensitive. You can, you can maybe patch the system or reboot it or you know, do, do all sorts of things with it. Um, sometimes uh, actually take a look at the system console. And there is very little visibility in, in, in what's inside those modules. So if you run antivirus, uh, the antivirus program can't look in there and say, well, uh, you have some bad firmware or you have some, uh, some state in there which uh, looks like uh, uh, it's a cross-site scripting attack. So uh, it's, it's good to keep the, these things in mind as we move on to um, actually talking about uh, the, the specifics of the attacks. So uh, in this case, uh, the attack that we found that uh, is really the, the interesting one in, in these systems is a log-based uh, log cross-site scripting. So uh, flavors of this have been known for quite a while, uh, maybe more than a decade. And traditionally, the, the way that has worked is that uh, you actually um, have an attacker who controls a certain domain and uh, they send a request to a certain web server, which is the target of the attack. And then when the web server tries to log this event, they try to reverse look up uh, the name uh, for that IP they, they saw. Uh, and what the attacker does then is uh, they send some bogus name, which is actually a script invocation. So uh, when that gets logged into the, into the server logs and gets viewed later on, uh, it actually um, results uh, in some kind of a compromise. And as we were doing this work, we actually saw an advisory that uh, uh, came into CERT uh, before ours. So we wanted to mention if, if somebody wants to look at the details for the um, IBM Blade Center uh, advisory, that's already available online. So uh, that's uh, work that was happening in parallel. Uh, but what we found is that uh, this vulnerability is an IBM RSA. Um, RSA is the name of the IBM Lights Out Management System in uh, Dell DRAC. Uh, and a number of other vendors have similar uh, modules, so it's uh, conceivable that uh, vulnerabilities exist there. Uh, the, the way the, the attack works is that uh, the attacker attempts to log in as a particular user. Now, this user doesn't exist in the system, so um, the login will fail. And, and that, that part, you know, the authentication module was designed properly, like we saw earlier with uh, all the XCS examples. Uh, you know, th that was uh, well thought out, but then it actually logs the event to the system log, and then what happens is when uh, the administrator views the system log for the lights out uh, system, uh, they end up executing, uh, they end up executing the script, so it's uh, not treated as, a, it's not, it's not escaped, basically. And at that point, the script can uh, access the internet, uh, do a number of uh, different interesting things. The, here's a, a little screenshot of uh, the, the execution for this attack on, on Dell. Uh, you can see our logo, which we fetch into the, into the DOM uh, just to indicate the script is running. Uh, this is, uh, you can see, when uh, the, logs, the logs tab is being accessed on the Lights Out system. Now, uh, to move on to some uh, more interesting, kind of more novel uh, XCS examples uh, for cross-channel scripting, We'll talk about a, a VoIP phone and a photo frame, uh, and actually a couple of different photo frames that we looked at. Uh, first of all, um, VoIP phones, um, I mean, I, I assume pretty much everybody here, uh, if you haven't used a VoIP phone, you, you've used Skype or you've used uh, Google Voice or something of that nature, 
And you're probably aware there are many devices on the market, uh, like uh, Skype phones that uh, go through your Wi-Fi network and uh, act as a normal phone. And it, it's, it's interesting, right? So, so these devices are very popular. The reason is that uh, going, doing calls through, the log, through uh, Ethernet is more efficient. You don't have this, this concept of circuits uh, that you have to establish that are dedicated. So, this is, uh, is pervasive technology, and over time, uh, all of these devices have some sort of, uh, they're, they're web enabled, right? They're talking on the ethernet, so uh, you can connect to them. This phone is no exception, it has a web interface. Uh, it supports SIP, which is the, the VoIP protocol for establishing connections. Uh, the web interface also has a, a call log feature, and then uh, that's, that's important, uh, as we'll see. So the, the normal way that uh, two phones uh, connect to each other over, uh, you know, to, to have a VoIP uh, conversation is uh, that first there's the SIP protocol which is used to, uh, you know, map from here's who I need to call, here's the username, here's their domain, uh, to actually what is, what is that peer, I, we need to negotiate which protocols we're going to be using and actually establish the connection. Uh, this is sort of a lightweight circuit, uh, if you want to call it that way. And then after that, there's uh, another protocol called RTP, which uh, is used to actually carry the, the, the voice, uh, the samples, right? So this is the binary date of the, uh, of the call. So we'll be focusing on the first step. And um, this, this attack actually uh, is very, there's a parallel uh, to the log attack that I mentioned earlier. Um, even though this is coming over a different protocol, uh, so a different channel, uh, in this case SIP, uh, what the attacker is doing is they're making a call and they say, well, I am uh, this, uh, you know, I'm this user. I'm uh, called script uh, source evil .com. right? And uh, that call might go through or not, right? Uh, maybe somebody will be there to answer, maybe not. If you call at the right time, uh, you can probably guarantee you'll, they'll miss the call so nobody will uh, really notice. Uh, but then what happens is when you connect to the web interface and access uh, the, the feature, which is uh, the call logs, you, you want to review uh, what are the missed calls on the phone and, and, and such, uh, you actually end up executing the script. So uh, again, we bring a little icon uh, into, the, into the page to, to uh, demonstrate the execution. Uh, but in fact, um, you can do any number of things uh, uh, from, that, uh, from that code. So um, now, as we move on uh, to uh, the photo frames, uh, I want to get a quick sense of uh, how many people use, uh, use a digital photo frame, either at home or in their office. Uh, okay, maybe close to half. Uh, so uh, this is a little chart which shows the, the, the market, the market for, for digital photo frames, and this is worldwide. Uh, you can see uh, there's, a, there's a nice growth there. Um, actually, you also see the spikes in the fourth quarter, uh, which, uh, are, um, which match with the holiday season. So our guess is that a lot of those get uh, purchased as gifts to uh, maybe friends or relatives. And all those people are not necessarily tech savvy and uh, uh, most likely not security savvy. So um, this, is, this is important. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, uh, to this point. So the particular frame that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about here is a Samsung model. Uh, it's actually a fascinating device, right? It can do a lot of things. Uh, it can fetch photos from a lot of places on the internet, from RSS feeds, uh, URL uh, that, that you give it to. Um, it, it supports Windows lights, the life. It can also play movies. So um, it, lots of features, cutting edge uh, digital photo frame. Now we we looked at it, and um, you know the, the way the way you, you operate it is you have a, you know you have a browser interface, you connect to it, you tell it where to get the photos from. Um, you can in the in the web interface you can see the, the current showing photo, the the one that physically the frame is showing at the moment. Um, and there's, there's a lot of configuration fields. There is RSS URL that uh, if you're doing a vulnerability assessment, you can actually look at and say well. Uh, can we inject something in there and uh, make it run? So in our scenario, uh, what we have to depend on is that uh, either, either you have an open session with that frame for, for management, 
or uh, maybe the default uh, admin credentials haven't been changed. Right? So, so what happens then is uh, uh, there's a CSRF which uh, the attacker can use uh, to install any kind of uh, payload which will be executed from the web interface. Right? So this, is, uh, this CSRF uh, maybe looks like, well, I want to change the URL for where my pictures are being fetched. And uh, here is the new URL. Uh, and that URL happens to be um, to have some uh, payload in it which is executable. So then anytime a user connects to manage the frame, uh, they end up running that, uh, that load. And uh, we, we actually have uh, a little proof of concept script which uh, is able to take, uh, take the currently showing picture, encode it properly, and then use a remote request to the internet uh, where it will just post the contents of the picture. Now, before anybody thinks, well, gee, I mean, is this only about uh, you know, photos of my kittens uh, getting posted on Flickr without my knowledge? I mean, that kind of stuff. I mean, why does it matter? Uh, well, we have, um, uh, you know, th this is, this is a, a, a quick, uh, just a, a screenshot of the attack. But the, the important thing is uh, a lot of these frames, they're, they're not necessarily going to people who are aware of security, right? So he, here you have grandma who got uh, her picture frame uh, and uh, she is browsing the web and uh, gets the frame infected, right? Uh, she, she doesn't know better. Uh, and then you have her son who's connecting from the office, uploading some pictures of the grandkids, uh, and his browser ends up uh, executing whatever uh, malicious payload was uh, installed on the frame. So now what you have is the intranet, uh, the, his browser, uh, which, which has uh, you know, regular access to the intranet is able to execute whatever, whatever that script is, uh, is asking it. So uh, the important thing is not necessarily about the pictures that, uh, that uh, could be exposed. It's, it's about the vulnerability and, and using these devices as uh, just part of the attack, right? Uh, and since uh, browsers normally have access to the intranet, uh, they can actually fetch additional scripts. So it doesn't have to be all uh, self-contained a large piece of uh, JavaScript that uh, it could be a, a modular uh, system. Um, there's a bonus feature on, on this frame in particular, which uh, we kind of uh, like to mention, which is you can actually view the current photo. You go to the web, uh, to, to a specific URL on the device, uh, and you can actually view the, the current photo without logging into the frame. So um, there, there, are a few, there are a few other scenarios, and uh, there are different types of vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, the East Starling photo frame that, that we looked at, uh, it can receive photos via email. I mean, this is, a, you know, this is generally a good idea, uh, but the address is predictable. So you can actually think of uh, some fairly realistic scenarios where this could be used as a vehicle for scams. Uh, so uh, you have spammers, they send millions of emails uh, to some addresses that uh, they expect might be uh, of picture frames. Uh, what the owners get is, is this uh, image which says, well, there's a technical problem, here's a number, please call it, and uh, then you get, uh, you know, you get uh, some, some service, right? You give them your, your credit card number, uh, whatnot. So uh, it's, uh, it's not inconceivable that, uh, you know, Along with, with the attacks which target an intranet, there are a lot of attacks that actually target consumers uh, with this, which uh, just comes to demonstrate that it's not about your pictures making it out there. It's, uh, it's uh, kind of a, a more serious problem. Now, um, are, there, are there any sort of uh, questions? That, did, did all of this so far seem um, reasonably consistent? OK, so then. Um, before going into the defenses, uh, I wanted to just step back a little bit and uh, rehash a little why, why this is important now. Now, obviously, 10 years ago, the way you configure one of these devices was uh, there was, uh, in, in the, you look at the user guide, and it says, well, you use COM1, and there's something about 9600 baud, and there is parity and all that. So uh, then you connect to a terminal, and there's nothing that, uh, that's really being executed in that terminal. So, so none of that uh, stuff. Now, over the last maybe five years, uh, these interfaces have become really prominent. And part of it is just the cost of the technology is going down. Everybody's starting to do it. Users are familiar with, uh, with the browser. So it, it makes a lot of sense. But the result is that uh, there is this aggregate uh, huge attack surface. Right? So there are different vulnerabilities, but they're everywhere. Now, 
so far, security hasn't been a high priority. I mean, part of it is because this problem is relatively new. Uh, but the trend is concerning, especially if you take into account um, a couple of other things that are happening, right? So you have this cross-channel scripting, which uh, is becoming relevant with all these different ways to, to connect to a device, whether it's FTP, whether it's a SIP, uh, or whatever other protocol. And then there's the rise of uh, you know, browsers as operating systems, which is something which uh, we've been hearing about a lot uh, uh, very recently. So uh, what that amounts to is that 24-7, now you have uh, the system which is, which is running, which is ready to run your scripts. And you don't really need the user to come and launch their browser in order to, to have the vulnerability uh, uh, be the, the attack being carried out to completion. So um, with, with that in mind, there, there are a few defenses that, uh, that we've been um, thinking about. And uh, they, they range from you know, what's available today, which is pretty much uh, all the stuff that we've been discussing so far. You know, how do you do an audit? Uh, what do you look for? Uh, and um, through uh, near term, some, some near term uh, defenses, which uh, uh, the, the one we, we started thinking about was site firewall, uh, which I'll go into uh, in a little bit uh, more time. Uh, but there is also a parallel development at Mozilla, which uh, is uh, kind of a superset of that, which uh, is called uh, CSP. And uh, what, what that does is uh, essentially uh, set some policies for content. So even, even if, uh, if your payload uh, acts weirdly, there, there's some policy which uh, actually over, overrides that behavior. And then longer term, obviously, uh, all these vulnerabilities have to be fixed at the source. So uh, there's, uh, there are some ideas that uh, we're going to share about that. Uh, so. Specifically, uh, to, to talk about the near term, uh, the, the concept we, we have uh, in the lab is, uh, is, we call it site firewall. Uh, what that does is um, it tries to, to not necessarily stop the attack before it happens, stop the, uh, the, the malicious code from being injected, but actually stop the attack from completing. And so uh, while uh, before you can see the, the C management interface, uh, you have the script executing and it's accessing uh, privileged files while the administrator is accessing the management interface. Uh, what happens with, uh, with this extension is that um, it prevents internal websites from accessing the internet. Well, what is the chance that if you have this NAS device, you go to, to one of its pages to look at some of your content and it tells you, well, you know, I really need this script from a server in Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not very likely that that will be necessary. So uh, what, what Site Firewall does is it blocks uh, any kind of content from, uh, for example, being fetched from the outside or, from, uh, or actually any, any request being issued. So if you have a, a XML HTTP request in JavaScript uh, and it's going outside uh, of your intranet, that will be blocked. So while you can still surf your uh, internet and you can uh, still access your uh, local network, uh, the, local, the, the sites that are hosted on the local network can't access externally. And obviously there are some, uh, uh, there's some trickiness there. If you have a wiki where you post the documents and they point outside, you have to be careful about that. But uh, essentially the idea is you reduce, uh, reduce the surface that's, uh, that's vulnerable. Now, uh, this is a screenshot of what happens after you have the extension. So you can see that uh, there is still, you know, this log is still messed up, right? So there is still something bad in there. Uh, but the point is that it was prevented from executing. And pretty much uh, this, this upcoming functionality in, in Firefox will uh, do similar things and more, uh, essentially using the, uh, the HTTP headers to specify a policy, which will then get enforced on the payload. So uh, moving on to the slightly longer term, uh, there have been different, there have been difficulties, you know, apart from this being relatively a new area, uh, difficulties in, in uh, building defenses on the server. Um, there is no single platform to build for. Every, every one of these vendors have their own, uh, maybe their own embedded OS. Um, some of it may be Linux or Wind River or whatever. They run some server on top of it, which could be third party or open source or whatnot. 
uh, and they have some extra logic on top. So coming up with a single solution or toolkit for, for all of them is, is kind of difficult. So uh, that's a challenge. Uh, and then adding insecure features is unavoidable, right? So you see this, this race to market new and new functionality uh, just to stay on top. Uh, that is not going to slow down, so you'll, you'll have more of these uh, features that maybe uh, try to bypass firewalls, especially if you look at uh, IP cameras. You got all these uh, interesting ways of saying, well, how can I access this camera from the outside? So you're bypassing the firewall. That, that's what you're doing. Um, now, if, uh, there, there, are some, there are some good, uh, good, good things here. If, if we look carefully, um, really, if you say, uh, if I'm building this toolkit and I, uh, and I look at the requirements, security is a top priority. And since all these embedded mini websites that you have on the internet, effectively, are not really high traffic, uh, you can afford some trade-offs. I mean, you can have uh, really, uh, you can have very aggressive escaping that, that you do on all the content that you're putting out. And, and that's going to cut a lot of the problems. Um, there's also a different kind of architectural trade-offs you have to make, uh, obviously, which is, you know, do you do this at, at the level of the web server? Is it a framework for developing websites? Or uh, is it a, a kernel level uh, sandboxing mechanism of sorts? So uh, there, there are some things to, to look at uh, before building it. But uh, overall, we feel that there, there are just good opportunities to bring some uh, more recent technology, more recent security technology in, into this. Uh, so one example is using CAPTCHAs, right? So uh, any kind of scripted attack is, uh, is actually nicely preventable using that simple technique. And we, in fact, saw the Buffalo NAS device using CAPTCHAs in a slightly different context, not, not in a security uh, uh, sense necessarily, but uh, mostly to prevent the user from doing something uh, without thinking, right? So deleting a big a share or, or something of that sort. So definitely feasible and uh, could be used more uh, to prevent some attacks. Now there's all, you know, all, all the other more advanced techniques that you know, people have been looking at uh, in, in, the, in the recent uh, past uh, with processing, uh, with the processes and how to sandbox different system calls. Uh, there's also, um, you could look at where data is stored and have some uh, more strict rules about who accesses it, uh, which service uh, will access it and um, what, what format will, will, will that service get the data in. So uh, to, to sum that up, uh, we, we plan, I mean, we, we're, we're looking at uh, uh, building a framework for developing secure websites. That's, uh, that's kind of the, the next thing we're, we're looking at and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be going in that direction. And so any, any feedback on that would be very interesting. Now, um, Eli has to uh, yeah, say so, something more, so okay, I'll so to thank if all of you who did stay until the end, uh, we have one more thing to add, uh, one more attack. Actually, it's my favorite one. Uh, I, I wanted to keep it for, for the end. Uh, so maybe one other more boring device. So we speak about the Buffalo like a few minutes ago about the idea of trying capture. Uh, but this one has a very, very cool feature, which is BitTorrent. So I know all of you only by movies through Netflix or Amazon and don't know what BitTorrent is, but some of the bad guys use it to share files, right? So like movie and so on. So what happened is uh, I have an attacker which will just create a torrent file which contain a file name, once again, which are a little bit payload, actually, HTML payload. And I create this new torrent, and I call it uh, the new release movie. So I don't know what blockbuster would be this, uh, this uh, summer, maybe Harry Potter. And I say, well, this is Harry Potter movie, point, dot torrent. And of course, the um, user have no idea what file is inside until he downloads a torrent. And then instead of trying to do one-on-one, -on -one, well, you simply apply it to a, well, a famous uh, torrent tracker, public torrent tracker. And the user goes to the page and say, aha! Wow, the new movie is out. I want to download it. So make sure that the torrent appear big. And so the guy just downloads the torrent into the NAS. So why is he doing this? It's because having a NAS is very convenient. You don't have to call, so your computer plug 24 hours. You just have your BitTorrent running on the NAS. And it completely makes sense from the user perspective to have this, this usability. 
you put your torrent on it, forget about it, go back from work and get your torrent, whether it's a Linux distribution or something like a little bit more illegal. And it's likely that people who do that won't report it, of course, because, well, they won't assume that, hey, I did download something illegal or something bad happened to me. Well, they won't probably report it. The problem is, as soon as they download this uh, torrent file to the NAS, um, then the NAS is taken over by simply downloading it before it even downloads, and the NAS un un unpack the torrent file, read the file, and as soon as the file is read, because it will be displayed on the web interface, then he runs arbitrary script from the attacker. And of course, the NAS is connected to internet, and it's completely logical how he's connected to internet because no internet connection, no torrent, or no file. So everything from the network perspective is completely normal. The problem is the NAS is taken over, and it will run forever because obviously we, have, we can redress the UI and not showing it. And this is one user, but if you choose carefully the name of your uh, torrent, then it's likely that you get more and more user taking over. So by simply uploading one file, you get this massive exploitation, uh, which is like um, another kind of problem, which is once again, you have one weak thing, which is this device, and you, you can abuse it. So uh, to give you a, a view of what he done in real, in real life, uh, here I just have a, a very specific file, you see it on the blue, which only redress part of the UI to print X, XCS attack. Of course, what I could have done is prevent my uh, Buffalo to display my file, so the file will stay forever on the NAS, and you won't see it because basically I just put a hiding pr property to the CSS. So uh, this really unfair that uh, this device can be used really as a step zone, either to attack your local uh, to the local network, or can be used also as a massive exploitation device, uh, maybe as a botnet. I mean, we didn't try, but uh, the problem is so far we didn't find an attack where you put it in a cron job, but since some of these devices have cron job, it's not likely that someone will figure out some time. So we have like an army of botnet, and uh, I wanted to make a quick poll. Uh, any of you did ever audit the device you have on your network? One person. Okay, so many of people just have this, this device sitting on your network for years and years and just not look at them, not even monitoring them. So some, if something bad happens, just like get unnoticed for I don't know how long time. So uh, one problem we have with this technology is it's sticky. Uh, people update their browser pretty fast because of the nice update mechanism they have. Uh, they do update sometimes their operating system, but it's slower. And they might even update plugin like Flash. Now, updating a firmware for an embedded device is problematic because we don't have a clean way right now to, make the, to push update to people. So once vulnerability is shipped to the user, it's likely that most of them won't patch. So they will stay there forever and forever, which is a concerning thing. Uh, so what should be done is maybe to, I mean, we always go through a lot of detail about that, but we really have to make an effort to standardize uh, the way we access them. Uh, the policy, the CSP policy by Mozilla is a really, really good step on this direction. Uh, having file, uh, firmware upgrade mechanism where your device tells you, hey, there's something you should download there every time you access, before you actually access the interface would be a good thing as well. Make sure that the rendering of the interface is secure is another good thing. And finally, uh, configuration backup should be uh, normalized. Um, that's all the thing we, we wanted to do. We also want to thank uh, Eric Lovett, which is not on the talk, but we, it's uh, one of our students who moved to work to Palm, did a great job with us. Park Associate, who provided us all the data about the cell figure we didn't have. And thanks also Intel, because they did a very good job at fixing uh, the problem we found in their vPro interface. Um, any question? Good. Now we we also have a few a few other slides we can show, but I mean so. Uh, well, I think they want to show the next slide. Okay. Right. So back to the previous slide, they say, hey, configuration backup is a problem. What's the problem with the configuration file? Well, take a router, right? I mean that's the good thing with this talk. We have so many uh, vulnerability. We can probably find example for everything, but this one is a, a nice one. Uh, so the Wi-Fi router from Linksys. Uh, is a stand, has a lot of standard features that you can accept, uh, uh, ex expect, sorry, like ac Wi-Fi access, uh, QoS, firewall, stateful inspection, all the things you can uh, right now expect, accept, 
expect from a device like this. It's a mature technology, been around for years, and well, everything should be pretty secure. Uh, now they have one nice thing, which is uh, you can export your configuration file. Your configuration file became uh, very, very complex, so you want to save it or distribute it to your friends, so you make a configuration file and you export it. So far, so good. Now the problem would be that uh, if you have this configuration file, an attacker can take your configuration file and say, well, what about I try to modify it? Well, there is absolutely no checksum, no, no nothing on this, so you edit the file as, well, as much as you want. Actually, it's plain text, so you don't have to go very far to do it. And then at some point you want to, re to restore it, then the file became compromised and tampered with, and you restore the file. So either it sits on your hard drive as a backup, or you want to export to a friend, or even you put it on the internet as a forum and say, hey, I have this cool optimization. Your internet connection will run 25 times faster. Why not? I mean, people don't know that. Or I did this very, very obscure trick on the Wi-Fi connection so you get better coverage. What about you try to take my configuration file and put it? Well, why not? So people download it, restore it, and as expected, uh, you have a uh, injection of our logo because you are able to put a script in the configuration file. So there is no check whether the file contains bad things. Once again, it's an XCS. Uh, so well, one might say, well, we can have an easy fix for that, right? Uh, what about we use signing? Well, we took a uh, public key, private key. Let's sign the keys inside the configuration file, and next time the attacker wants to to modify it, then it does not work because uh, it's not uns uh, it's tampered with and we detect it. Uh, first problem with this fix is then configuration are not portable across devices. So for a personal router, it's not a problem. Now, if you have one of those switches, uh, it became a problem because you want be you want to spread the same configuration everywhere. Second problem is take another Linksys device. It's not the same. We didn't find the same vulnerability on this one, but take this camera from Linksys. Uh, this one has a very nice vulnerability. You can actually include every file you want, not only from the interface, but also from the underneath Linux system. As you see here is the ETC shadow of this device. It's not the password from the admin. It's the password used by Linksys on every device. If you ask me what the password is, I don't know. Uh, if you want to crack it, then uh, you can be free to do that. I don't know what it is. Uh, but now if you combine the two of them, then you end up by the idea that, well, the attacker can do a remote inclusion get the private key, use the private key, send back the configuration file, and you're back to square one. So it's not easy to fix this. Uh, one way we can see about this one would have been to use a, um, to use the administrator password as a, as a way to sign the, the file, actually doing HMAC. So it's not easy to fix every one of these. Uh, it's just one thing that it's not really easy to, to come up with a fix which is robust and resilient to different kind of attack. And just the surprising thing happened all the time. Uh, just to finish, uh, we found a bunch of attack. Uh, we did just probably show you maybe 20 of the attack we found. We have many, many, many of them, um, many, many vendors, uh, some switches, guy, uh, injection of through telnet, through terminal, and some light out management, as we said, the RSI1 and the ETLV Pro uh, attack as well, as the Intel Pro is patch. Um, that's pretty much it for what we, we've got for you today. Thank you.